Ok, je pense qu'on va commencer. Bienvenue tout le monde. Mon nom est Will Stroy, je suis directeur de l'Institut d'études canadiennes de McGill. Et c'est un grand plaisir pour moi de vous, euh, de vous recevoir aujourd'hui pour le, la conférence William R. Eakin. I'd like to welcome you all to the William R. Eakin Lecture for the Winter 2012 term. This year, um, we've been particularly lucky to have two Eakin Fellows in the Institute. Andrew Holman, who was with us in the fall, delivered a lecture, some of you may have been here, on Reading Canada in American Juvenile Fiction. And of course, uh, Judy Rebeck, who will be delivering this afternoon's lecture. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to announce that the fall Eakin Scholar for 2011-12, that's actually 2012, um, 13 will be Karen Fricker from the University of London, and in the winter term, we're welcoming Claire Campbell from Dalhousie University. Now, my colleague and dear friend, Carrie Rensler, will be formally introducing Judy in just a minute, but first I'd like to invite Christopher Manfredi, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and a good friend of the Institute, to the podium to say a few words on behalf of the faculty. Chris? Uh, merci, Will. Comme toi, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être ici uh, cet après-midi. Um, I'm especially happy to be here to welcome all of you to the Eakin Lecture and to say a special thank you in particular to the Eakin family uh, for all of its generous and ongoing contributions to the university. In particular, the creation of the Eakin Visiting Fellowship in Canadian Studies in honor of William R. Eakin has brought nine scholars so far. We'll have two more. I'm, this is why I'm impressed with MISC. It's only uh, April of 2012, and you've got next year's lineup all set. Uh, I don't have yesterday, uh, tomorrow planned. Actually, I don't have yesterday planned yet either, but I certainly don't have tomorrow planned. Uh, have brought nine and now 11 scholars to the MISC for one or two terms. Uh, they're a, an engaging and uh, dynamic group of people from across Canada and around the world who have taken up the Econ Fellowship, and we're very fortunate to have that kind of support from the Eakin family for uh, the programming at MISC. We wouldn't be able to do events like this without the support of uh, our supporters, and the Eakin family has been uh, one of our uh, best supporters, especially for the Institute. And I will just uh, give a special mention for Gail Eakin, who I've come to know over several years and is a terif terrific supporter of MISC and the faculty and a wonderful artist as well, so I welcome her and her family. Um, now that you've heard very few words from me, we're all very pleased to be able to hear what Judy Rebeck has been working on since she's been at MISC since January, and to introduce her, I'd like to call on uh, Carrie Rentschler. Carrie is Associate Professor in the Department of Art History and Communication Studies. She is the Will William Dawson Scholar of Feminist Media Studies and serves as director of the McGill Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. So, Carrie. Thank you, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure to have Judy Rebick here in Montreal for the past few months. A journalist by trade, an activist by nature, Judy Rebick is leading the charge for social justice through print, in broadcast, and in person, as so many of you know. From 2002 until 2010, Rebeck held the Sam Gindin Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson University. She is former president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women and lends her considerable expertise to Fair Vote Canada and Alternatives, a Quebec-based organization. In the 1990s, Rebeck hosted two national TV shows on CBC and continues as a frequent commentator on the airwaves. She is also the founding publisher of Rabble.ca, Canada's most active and independent online news and discussion site. This semester, some of our students have been lucky enough to take Professor Rebick's senior level course, The Women's Movement in Canada, that she teaches through the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada and the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. I've heard exactly how amazing she is as a professor from several students, and I want to thank her for sharing her deep knowledge and her commitments to activist-inspired education with our students. I know we're all eager to hear Judy speak about her new book, Occupy This, Exploring the Occupy Movement. So without further ado, 
Please join me in welcoming Judy Rebick to the podium. Well, thanks, Carrie. Uh, je vais, je vais uh, présenter en, en, en anglais, mais je suis capable de répondre en français si vous avez des questions. Um, so I'm very excited to be here, and um, I, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I thank the Eakin family, too, for financing this extraordinary fellowship that I was lucky enough to get, um, it, and, uh, and also MISC. McGill has all these crazy acronyms, which I just started to remember about two weeks ago, and now I'm leaving soon. So, But anyway, MISC is the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, in case any of you don't know that. Like, it took me about two months to remember it. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, and so and the gender studies one I'll never remember. I just can't, I just can't get the <laughs> letters right. So um, uh, MISC is really an amazing place. Uh, it's uh, this little house down the street here, and the people are wonderful, and they put on great events. We had this extraordinary conference on crime um, and the future of justice in Canada, where we had one panel with police chiefs, the next panel with Alex Hundert, who's supposed to be the ringleader of the Black Bloc in Toronto. It was really an amazing, <laughs> an amazing, um, he's not, by the way, but the police thought he was. <laughs> Um, a ringleader, you know, in an anarchist group is kind of a contradiction in terms, but, but anyway, um, it was really an amazing uh, uh, session. I'd just never seen anything quite like it, and, uh, and I think MISC is great doing this kinds of great diversity of things. So I hope, I hope to contribute to that. Um, as this is also, my time here has been very different than I expected. So the first thing I, I want to say is, using the words of a word I don't usually use is that I feel blessed that I'm here during this extraordinary student strike and in Quebec. I think this is a historic moment for uh, the movement that I talk about in Occupy This. And I think that the student movement here in Quebec is um, part of this new generation that's standing up against injustice and inequality. And uh, for those of you that were lucky enough to be on that demonstration last Thursday, which I believe was the largest demonstration, not just in the history of Quebec, but also in the history of all of Canada, and was uh, full of joy and passion and militancy. And I know that there's lots of people at McGill that haven't participated in this strike, but I think it's absolutely wonderful. So I want to start with a tribute to those students, and I'm wearing my red thing. And you're allowed to applaud if, if you agree. <laughs> And the second thing is um, uh, that I was yesterday at a wonderful, um, extraordinary event honoring Madeleine Perrin, who uh, was a friend of mine and is a legendary trade unionist, was a legendary trade unionist in Quebec. She died about a month ago, at the age of 93, and was uh, an, extraordinary, an extraordinary person in many, many ways. She fought to Plessy. She was jailed. Uh, she was jailed uh, for treason, for organizing a union in this province at a time when uh, the government was, I think, a neo-fascist government. And uh, she eventually went to Ontario and organized a can can Canadian union movement and raised the issues of why it was that the majority of Canadian unions were American-based, she then became, she was a feminist, she organized, she helped to found NAC, helped to create NAC, and she was uh, constantly on the side of Aboriginal women, of women, of, of immigrant women, of women of color, always supporting uh, those who are oppressed. So I'd like to uh, dedicate this talk to her because I know that she would have been really happy uh, to know what's happening in the world right now. Uh, I think it would have, unfortunately, her health was too fragile for her to really understand it uh, in this last year, but I know that it would have made her just deliriously happy to see young people taking up the torch that she held her whole life. Okay, so having started this massive introduction, <laughs> is there anybody here from Occupy Montreal? Bon, okay, good, <laughs> merci. I don't cover Occupy Montreal in my book because I didn't spend enough time there, but I hope you will contribute in the discussion um, and uh, let us know what you're doing now and what's going on now. So, um, I, I, like I say, uh, things here didn't quite turn out the way I expected it to. I expected to come to um, 
uh, to uh, McGill and work on my memoir because that's what I had been working on and I thought I, I accepted the fellowship because I thought or I applied for the fellowship because I thought it was kind of romantic. I was at McGill in the 60s at the McGill Daily. It's when I became a radical. It's when I became a journalist. Um, it was really how I set out on my path and it's how my book begins is my time at the McGill Daily. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to finish writing the book at McGill? And that was my plan. <laughs> Only life doesn't always work out that way. And Occupy happened. And uh, I was going to stay out of, and I had for almost a year, I had stayed out of activism for almost a year in order to write my memoir. <laughs> and then Occupy happened. <laughs> and my friend Velcro, who's Velcro Ripper, who's a filmmaker and happens to be living in Brooklyn, which is also, by the way, where I was, I grew up, he just called me. He says, you've got to get down here, Judy. This is your thing. This is your thing. You have to come down here. So I did. I went down to Occupy Wall Street. And I thought, OK, I'll just have to put the memoir aside for a while. <laughs> and I want to, the book begins with um, my visit to Occupy Wall Street. And I'm not going to go into it, because I want you to buy the book. It's only $3.99, OK? Like, it's a real bargain. And you can, you have to, but you have to download it. It's only an electronic book. And if anybody's interested in the saga of electronic books and how the publishing industry doesn't really know what they're doing with electronic books, I can talk to you about it either in the question period or the reception. But anyway, you can download it on Kindle, on Kobo, on iBooks. iBooks, it's the prettiest. And uh, you can also download it onto your computer from Google Books, like that is without a reader, on Google Books or, um, or, um, from penguin.ca, and I apologize, it's not available in open source, and we can talk about that in the, in the question period if you wish. Okay, so I, my view about Occupy is that it is, it is part of a global movement, a global uprising against neoliberalism, what we in academe call neoliberalism, what most people all over the world call neoliberalism, or what we often call in Canada corporate capitalism or neoconservatism. And that is the idea that the market should control everything, that the, that the public sector, that the government is really, uh, the only purpose of the government is to uh, uh, create, well, allow cre the creation of wealth in the private sector and then defend the people who are getting so rich while the rest of us are getting so poor. Of course, they don't put it that way. But really, if we look at, um, if we look at, uh, corporate capitalism, this is what we see, which is a greedy corporate elite gobbling up the world. And I don't think that is a slight exaggeration at all. I know there's people here who might not agree with me, but if we want to look at it historically, I mean, I've never particularly liked capitalism as a system. That's full disclosure. <laughs> I've always thought it was an inherently unjust system. But the newest form of capitalism is so much more unjust than the kind of capitalism that I grew up with, where people actually did have some opportunity to um, improve their economic circumstance, where we didn't have homeless people. We didn't have homeless people. You know, It's hard to remember that in this country, at least, there, in New York, there used to be homeless people in the 60s, but mostly they were hippies you know, who chose to be on the street, who chose not to work. But here in Canada, we didn't have homeless people in the 60s. We had poor people on Indian reservations. But we didn't have homeless people in the cities. We had a relatively decent social safety net. Um, people had uh, access to university, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't always like this. And the reason it got like this was through government policy. And particularly in Canada, we can really see that very rapidly. So, We've had this storm of government since the 1970s, since Margaret Thatcher said, there is no society, there's only individuals and families. And she proceeded, and as did Ronald Reagan, to restructure the economy. It started with a restructure of the economy to create neoliberalism, to create you know, tax cuts, privatization. We all know the, uh, the, uh, the mantras. But it, but it was in 2008, no, so it, the first place they tried it was in the global south. Started in Chile because it, it was easy there, it was a dictatorship. And the, they called it a structural, and then in the global south they called it structural adjustment programs. And this was the impact of it. Destruction of the environment, destruction of the traditional ways of living, 
uh, a fantastic uh, increase in the gap between rich and poor, a shift in the money that governments had in the global south from paying for social costs like education and health care to paying off debt, so they were lent money at huge interest rates, and then the debt became more and more and more and more the largest part of their expenditures, and what money there was went to security rather than to social programs. And then we had it here. And this is my favorite cartoon. There's a lot of cartoons around about the gap between the rich and the rest of us, but I like this one the best <laughs> because there's a chance of actually getting him to go over if we work together. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> So, uh, so what happened was then it started to have an economic impact here, depending on where you live when it happened. And of course, the first impact was there was an increase in wealth, but more and more that wealth went to the upper 1%, as Wall Street, as the Occupy Wall Street brilliantly said, the top 1%, the gap between rich and poor. It's not like Occupy Wall Street was the first one to talk about the gap between rich and poor. Lots of people have been talking about it. Sheila, Linda, Linda McQuaig, for example, um, first wrote about it way back in the early 1990s she, in a book called Shoot the Hippo um, about what was happening in New Zealand and, and this whole deficit hysteria uh, that was created as a way to convince people of these kinds of policies. And, uh, and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives also has been publishing material for many, many uh, years about the gap between rich and poor, but Occupy Wall Street just had that little twist on it which suddenly made sense to people and that is we are the 99% and they are the 1% and increasingly that's true. And so what happened in 2008 is there was a massive, as you know, economic crisis, a financial crisis, you know, the, the potential of the collapse of Wall Street, the potential of the collapse of big corporations. And as Tommy Shoemaker, who's not exactly a radical, said to me today, it was like basically uh, socialism for the rich. So it was socialize, uh, privatize the profit and socialize the debt. That was the solution. I thought when I wrote Transforming Power, which was my last book, I thought, well, they're going to have to do something about this. I mean, the combination of the economic crisis and the environmental crisis is so severe that capitalism won't be able to survive if they don't find solutions. So I figured somebody's going to come up with an alternative. And for some hopeful 35 seconds, it seemed like Obama might present at least some kind of alternative. Um, but nobody did. Nobody did. And, uh, and so at the political level, nobody did present an alternative. And so that's what happened. They were bailed out. The people who, uh, who paid for it, whether it was in Europe or the United States, and I'll come to Canada in a minute, were the, were, were the middle class and the poor. Rich people didn't pay for it. I mean, I didn't notice anybody jumping out of windows at Wall Street, did you? That's what happened in 1929. I'm not saying they should jump out of windows. I just think they should walk out the door. But, <laughs> but um, that's, that's kind of how politics has changed. You know, if I'd been giving you this speech in the, in the 60s, I'd say, yeah, and they should all jump out of the window. So anyway, <laughs> <maybe we'll> get, <laughs> I'll come back to that. Um, so, um, so anyway... Uh, so, so we saw an economic crisis almost exactly the same time that we started to under, well, we understood before this that, that we started to understand the massive environmental crisis, particularly around climate change, and yet there was no solution being brought forward by the political classes, nothing. Like they just went, and the, and the, and the, and the Wall Street guys, I mean, they just figured out another way to make money out of all of it. Like it's really... I mean, morally speaking, it's disgusting what happened, really. You know, if you want to think in moral terms, which I try not to, but sometimes it's hard not to. And in Canada, you know, we got, I, I say this, Jim Flaherty gave a performance during the beginning of Occupy Wall Street, which could have been like just the most brilliant sketch on Saturday Night Live. Because he basically said, well, I actually, I have sympathy for the Occupy Wall Street. Uh, people, but you know, Canada is not the same. In Canada, we have regulated banks, we have a progressive tax system, all of which 
He would do everything. In a, he's already destroyed the, regu- the, 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 the progressive tax system, and he would do everything he could not to have regulated banks. And they're not going to do it right away, but that's his ideology. So, so everybody says, well, in Canada, it's not so bad. And it is true that it's not so bad in Canada. It's not so bad in Canada for a lot of reasons, for most of us. It is, bad. It is so bad for indigenous people. It is so bad for poor and homeless people. But for most of us, we haven't seen this precipitous collapse of the middle class uh, the way we have in Europe and in, and in the United States. And we haven't yet, and we haven't seen uh, the kind of mortgage crisis that they had in the United States because we do have regulated banks and we do have better laws. Plus, we have a stronger labor movement, which is resisting these policies for many years. So, but it's happening now. The, the, today, the top 1% earn one-third of the wealth after tax wealth. In the 19, and this, in a similar, in, this was between 2007, uh, between uh, 1997 and 2007, which was a big economic period of economic growth. The last time there was a period of economic growth like that, the top 1% earned 8% of the wealth. Why? Because it was a more progressive tax system. We had the fastest growing gap between the rich and the rest of us in the OECD countries. Faster growing than the United States, and the top 1% is getting a higher share of the income in Canada than in the United States. We have, in the United States, deindustrialization has been going on since Reagan. In Canada, it started more recently, but it's dramatic. It's dramatic, the extent to which deindustrialization is occurring, and it's a strategy of our federal government. They're basically seeing, they want Canada to go back to the days, I always get this wrong, of the hewers of wood and carriers of water. Thank you. That's what they're trying to do, except this time we're not carrying water, we're carrying oil. And uh, this is what they're trying to do. Get, they don't care about deindustrialization. They think we can win everything through, uh, through, through oil and through mining. And that, that's the way we can keep the economy going. And that's why they're against any kind of environmental sustainability. Plus, we've seen a dramatic decline in, top, in, in marginal tax rates, in the top tax rates. Really dramatic decline. All of these policies are the policies that have led to the kind of gaps and the kind of crises that we've seen in Europe. Okay, enough of what's wrong. And there's uh, the, the, a nice graphic about the rich and the rest of us in Canada. Okay, now I'm going to go, I think the next one is, oh yeah. Ah, what me worry? More of the same, I said that already. Oh, already, see I should have showed you this before. Oh well, PowerPoint. Okay, so now we come to 2011. We come to 2011, when it becomes clear that our leaders are not going to solve the problems. And oddly, you know, I wrote Transforming Power about the kinds of movements I saw around the world that were making a change. I realized that the political left had hit a dead end and it was keeping beating its head up against the same brick wall. And I didn't think that was very useful, so I said, where is the left actually making progress? And I first went to Latin America. Anyway, long story short, um, the, I was writing a book about where there was hope. So I didn't write anything about the Middle East, okay, at first, nothing. Because I spent a lot of time, like I've been an activist around the Middle East for a long time. I've worked with feminists in Iraq and Iran and Palestine and Gaza, including Gaza. I've never, uh, you know, I saw no hope in the Middle East. So that was me, right? Until Sunira Tabani said, you can't write a book about the future of the world and the better world without writing about the Middle East. So I did write about it, but I wrote about peace. I didn't write about anything else. And then, to much of my surprise and all of our total astonishment, where did the uprising begin but in Tunisia and then Egypt? And, we, and everyone was inspired. Even the reporters on CNN were, were inspired by it. So I want to go a little review of the year. Starting with, and, and I want you to, I'm just going to tell you what all these things are, okay? Tahrir Square, Madrid, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Oakland, Occupy Toronto. Oh. Now, we had Occupy Toronto. We had Occupy Montreal. We had Occupy Nova Scotia. We had Occupy Vancouver. So we had Occupy in, in, in Canada, not quite as strong as it was in the States, but it was just as strong. And we've had Occupy London. Now, I go through these quickly, but I want you to know that in Spain, the Indignados, who started last spring, started last spring, um, right after uh, Tahrir Square, they had a very similar history to Occupy Wall Street. 
they were, uh, the, except they're a bit stronger, so the police, you know, pushed them out, then they reoccupied, the police pushed them out, they reoccupied, went back and forth, back and forth, and finally they stayed. And then they decided at the end of the summer that they were going to uh, close the tents and go into the neighborhoods. And they said, they have a big sign saying, we haven't left, we're in your consciousness. And they, and I have at the end a slide of what happened in, Madrid, in, in Spain last week. And they went into the neighborhoods and they organized in the neighborhoods. And things are very bad in Spain, so things like health, health clinics were cut. And so they occupied the health clinics and they got doctors and nurses at first to volunteer to work in those health clinics to provide the services that the government had cut. And then they started the barter system, so they have what they call the echo instead of the euro. And they have their own, they've developed their own money. And they started doing things like they were closing down public um, old folks residences and they have old people occupying the old folks residences. And they have like 90 year olds as spokespeople for the indignados, okay? Like, it's been amazing in Spain what they've done. And they're about six months ahead of us. And, and it's all, everyone's keeping in touch. A lot of what they did in Spain, Occupy Wall Street picked up and continued. And of course, Occupy Wall Street is providing material and knowledge for everyone else. So I wanted to talk a bit about how I see Occupy Wall Street. So one of my ideas about it is that Occupy Wall Street, it reminds me of The Wizard of Oz. You know, Dorothy and her friends, they go to see the wizard because they figure they need the wizard to solve their problems. And we all know the story, the lion needs a heart, the tin man, no, the lion needs courage, the tin man needs a heart, and the, the what do you call it, straw man, yeah, he needs a brain. And so they're off to see the wizard. And of course, what do they find? And that's sort of us over the last 30 years, I think. And what do they find? They find that the wizard is a fraud. The wizard has nothing to give them. But lo and behold, they have it in them. And I think that's what Occupy is telling us. And I think that's what Occupy is showing us. So, and I use Bridget Dupap here as an example of courage. She was, she is part of Occupy. She's part of Occupy Ottawa. But this happened before Occupy. It happened when a page in the Senate gave up one of the best jobs that a political science student could ever want to protest Harper, to take a stand. And, uh, okay, you know, she doesn't normally wear pigtails. Like, she did it brilliantly, right? She, not pigtails. She wore a braid. She looks like she's about 14 in that picture. She did it brilliantly. She had support to do it, too. But she did it brilliantly. And it was so powerful because people saw you can stand up. You see, and also saw she gave up people, like, you know, Evan Solomon says, well, you know, you're going to lose your job. Of course she knew she was going to lose her job. She's very smart, you know. Yeah. Of course she knew. She was giving up her job to protest against Harper, to say, my generation wants him to stop. And that was a very important moment. And that shows the courage of this generation. And we saw it in Occupy as well, where not just homeless people are living in part, Middle-class kids are living in parks, living in tents in the winter time. That's how brave and courageous they are. You know, some of the nonviolent action, like Occupy Oakland, where I'd never seen, I haven't seen anything like that since the six, since the civil rights movement, where a, 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 where a movement marches on police who are totally armed and take blows and just keep marching, which resulted in almost the, you know, close to the resignation of the mayor of Oakland. So this movement has amazing courage. And it's smart, so smart. You know, here's a generation who have had more bullshit, you'll pardon my French, thrown at them. I shouldn't say pardon my French, that's terrible. Why did I say that? Oh my God, we have all these terrible phrases in our head. Okay. Um, all this, all this Bull thrown at them, you know, from Madison Avenue, from television, from movies, from video games, from every kind of diversion that they have been fed since they were children. And they're saying, stop! No, we're not listening anymore. We're not listening. And, you know, I have a friend who's an economist, and when I said, he said, well, the big problem is there's no alternative to, to the to neoliberalism. And I said, not yet. 
And he said, oh, you're talking about Occupy. Eh? Well, they're setting up villages in parks. And I said, exactly. That's what they're doing. They're setting up villages in parks so they can figure out another way to do things, that they can show that there's another way to live that isn't about standing on someone's head to get ahead. It's about standing on each other's shoulders to get ahead. It's about supporting each other. It's about solidarity. And they also have the brilliance of how to spin it, if you want, or how to talk about it. So the We Are the 99% and that Tumblr site in which people told stories. And if you haven't seen it, it's um, We Are the 99%. It just put that in, just put that in uh, Google and you'll find it. And it's person after person who writes their story by hand and then it's printed underneath them and a picture of them. And, and the stories of all the people in the United States who are suffering, every kind of person, because of the economic policies of government and Wall Street. And then the, we are the 99% completely transformed the discourse in the United States. No one was talking about economic equality before Occupy Wall Street, and now everybody's talking about economic equality. And then love. I, I'm, I'm not somebody who uses this word in this way very often, but I decide I have to force myself. Because um, my friend Velcro is doing a film called Occupy Love. And one of the things that I notice and he notices in every Occupy site that he went to, and he'd gone all over the world to them, is this feeling of love in the sites, this feeling of connection. Not love in the sense of romantic love, which is the way we think of it, but love in the sense of our connection to each other. And if there's anything terrible that neoliberalism has done is it's destroyed that, that sense of community that our grand, that my grandparents had, you know, that, that, my, that our parents might have had in the, in the 30s or, your, or grandparents of the current generation in the labor movement that we had in the 60s. That sense of connection to other people, the feeling of love and compassion for other people, the feeling of working together. And that's why I think the encampments were so important. Because b having to feed each other, clothe each other, house each other was such an important part of building that sense of community. And, and, and such an important part of getting away from the culture of the left, which tends to be you know, that the often tends to be the uh, arrogance of small differences, you know, the pettiness of small differences, you know, fight about every little difference and focus on the differences and don't focus on what we have in common and what we, uh, <clears throat> what we share and how we can move forward. But always, oh, how could you say that? You know, you still see it on Facebook. I'm not saying it's gone away that, you know, like when I put up my book and somebody on Facebook says, you're destroying independent bookstores. And the next person says, oh, I'm okay with e-books. They're okay, but what about open source? You know, and I'm saying, hey, guys, like I just put out a book for $3.99. Okay, I thought that was pretty good, you know? So anyway, so, but, you know, we still see that negative culture. But in Occupy Wall Street, when it began, and things have changed, of course, we didn't see it. What we saw were people working together to make, create a community, to create a society in miniature and to show that it could be done differently. So how do they do that? Well, one is democracy. And I think Occupy, the Occupy movement is the most important experiment in democracy that we've seen, at least in the global north. I think experiments like participatory budgeting and, 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 and other kinds of um, experiments have been important too. But you know, the consensus, okay, so are we gonna show, we're gonna show, okay, we're gonna show and tell here, okay? So the first thing is, in, in, in New York, uh, they weren't allowed to have um, they weren't allowed to have uh, amplification, so they started using this thing called the people's mic. So somebody goes, "Mic check," like that. <laughs> mic check, and then everybody goes, "Mic check." Okay, so that's how you get the floor, right? Of course, if somebody doesn't want people don't want you to talk, like you're some person who talks too much, maybe they won't say mic check when you say mic check. But anyway, that's another thing. So mic check. And then, <laughs> mic check. And then, when I speak, you answer. So I say, I think, I think Occupy Wall Street, Street is the most important, the most important social, movement social movement that we've seen, that we've seen in North America. In since the 1960s, since the 1960s 
and maybe more important. Okay, you feel that? And then there's the, I can't, okay, I broke my shoulder three weeks ago, so I can't twinkle. I can only twinkle with one hand. <laughs> then there's the twinkling, you know, which the, uh, the U.S. comedy shows really had a good time with twinkle, you know. <laughs> so, but it's actually quite good. Would you like to demonstrate since I can't? Yeah, okay, so when you like something, you put your hands up and you twinkle them, you know, you twinkle them. And then if you're not so crazy about it, yeah. And then if you don't like it, if you really don't like it, you block, okay? And that's how the consensus process works. And it's very smart, actually, because one of the problems with consensus is you can't, you don't really get a sense of how much people agree or disagree, and that gives you a sense, right? And everybody's been using it. Um, all through the Occupy sites, even when they can use amplification. I mean, it's obviously uh, not so useful for a lecturer, but <laughs> yes? Oh, okay. Okay. Clarification, right, right. Okay. Again, my understanding of the origin, because I used to work with deaf people, is that's what deaf people do when they want to, they want to applaud. Yeah. So, so thanks for that. So, um, so this kind of process was one which was very inclusive. And consensus isn't anything new. We use consensus in the women's movement, or we tried to, and we use use it in the peace movement, and so on. But what's new here is, what was new here was the way, in my view, the way it was used. And I don't have time to get into that, but I get into it in the book. And the other thing that I really was moved by, especially in Occupy Wall Street, but also in Toronto, was the inclusion. Um, I think that's my next. So democracy we can talk about more, but there's a lot of democratic. So, okay, we'll talk about network politics. So the other thing is, this is, of course, an online generation. And it's not just that they use online methods like Facebook and Twitter and, you know, all kinds of websites and YouTube. And, you know, if, uh, if, um, if uh, the middle, the Arab Spring was the Facebook and Twitter revolution, then Occupy is the live stream revolution because everything that happens is live streamed, which is a kind of live television. In Toronto, when they took down the Occupy site, the whole thing was not just live stream, but it's also CP24, 24 hour station carried the live stream from Occupy Toronto. It was really quite amazing. And so, um, but it's not just that. It's also how the camps are organized. It's very much how online organizing happens. And I go into a fair bit of detail on that in the book. And so when you go into an Occupy site, if you, if you had any sort of notions of how open source works or how open source uh, conferences work called unconferences, you see a lot of the same methods of work. And, and it's very inclusive. So I tell a couple of stories in the book, one of which I'll tell here, which is we met a young woman um, whose name, of course, escapes me right now, who was 20 years old, who got involved in Occupy, and, she'd never, and she got involved in the cleanup crew in Occupy New York. She got involved in the Occupy Wall Street. She got involved in the cleanup crew because she wanted to do something kind of productive and concrete, and she'd never really been involved in politics before. And lots of people you meet in Occupy had never been involved in politics before, activism of any kind. And so she got involved in that. And lo and behold, the, when the first time that Bloomfield tried to um, get rid of Occupy New York, he said it was dirty. That was why he was getting rid of them. It was dirty. So he... Um, so he, so what they decided to do is put out a call to New Yorkers to come and clean up the site. And over a thousand New Yorkers came down overnight, all night. It was a rainy night too, to clean up the site. And this young woman led that process. And every hour or so she'd get up and give a motivating speech about cleaning up the site and saving Occupy Wall Street. And of course, at the same time, the FFL-CIO called the unions in the area and they surrounded the site so that if police did come, they would face union lines before they could evict the site. But this young woman, who'd never done anything before like this in her life, became transformed by this experience. And so many people I've met on Occupy sites, that's true of. So the Occupy site, you know, often when you come into a left meeting, a friend of mine once said, 
well, you know, I, I, went, I, I looked at the left and then I went to one of their meetings and I thought, do I really want these people to run the country? You know, because often when you go to left meetings, people are arguing, they're, you know, they're using certain language which is exclusive, they're not necessarily friendly to people who come. Um, and, and so it's an exclusive uh, uh, place, not an inclusive place. And uh, lots of people have noticed that, but we haven't really been able to change that culture. But in Occupy, as soon as you're in on the site, as soon as you're in the site, you're part of the process. And you can get involved in a working committee, you can get involved in the GA. And the ability of people, you know, they say there's no, they're leaderless, but really what they are is a movement of leaders. Everyone can be a leader doing what they do best. And this is very much like open source software works as well. So that's very important part of it. And the other part of the, of, the, of the network politics is the international stuff. So, I mean, there are people working on online processes that can make consensus uh, across locations, across, even across countries. And that's happening. In fact, John, John Richardson in, in, in Vancouver is one of the people working on that. But right now, it's, it's, it's limited in, to, in terms of locality. Um, but with network politics, somebody calls an action, and then if other people agree, they come on. If they don't, they don't. And it really, it's been working pretty well. I think it could work better, but it's been working pretty well. And then the inclusion I talked about. Anybody's involved. Anybody can be involved. And one of the amazing things about Occupy, and also one of the things that caused a lot of problems for Occupy, was the inclusion of homeless people and people with mental health problems. I've been on the left a long time, and I've never seen people, homeless people who are living on the streets come to a meeting like this, but in Toronto they do. They're coming to meetings now and participating. They're, a lot of them are participating on committees. For the first time in their lives, they feel part of a community. On the other side of that is some people who are in that condition aren't able to do that and are very, can be very disruptive. And because you have a radical, a kind of radical philosophy of inclusion, some people don't want to exclude some of those people who are disruptive or who are racist, some of them. I've run into a couple who are racist or anti-Semitic. So there, this is a struggle that occupies going through pretty well every city that I know of, is, is how to be inclusive without letting people dominate or scare away other people. Um, but, but they are. And one, of, and one of the problems is this idea we are all one. And so you've got a lot of young people who've never been involved in all the debates about equality that we've had over the last 30 or 40 years. And they say, well, why should we have a women's caucus? Why should there be a people of color caucus? After all, we're all one. We're all equal. But, and we want to be equal for sure. And everyone who's an Occupy has the intention to be equal. But unfortunately, how come that's not working? It's not really true because women are still holding up the world. Women are still unequal and people of color and so on. We're still facing discrimination in the society and that reflects and we see that, you know, a lot of the original occupies were dominated by young white men and that makes sense because they have the most sense of entitlement still to this day after 40 years of feminism that's still happening. So we had Occupy Patriarchy, Occupy the Hood. I, that went by fast, eh? You want to see it again? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Occupy patriarchy, occupy the hood. And the challenge from uh, some indigenous people about the word occupy itself, which has been, has produced a really great, um, that was, um, I think that was um, Calamity Jane, uh, that woman with the gun, <laughs> who was my hero when I was a kid. Okay, so anyway, um, so now we hear from the media that Occupy is finished, it's over, you know. And uh, the media, you know, they have a five minute attention span and you know, we saw, like it used to be Gandhi would say, first they ignore you, then they make fun of you, then they attack you, then they accept you. And that used to happen over a 20 year period, now it happens over five days, you know. So, <laughs> so first they ignored Occupy Wall Street, then they became like fell in love with it for like about two weeks. You know, and everything was like, oh, isn't this great? And young people, they're finally getting active and blah, blah, blah. And then they turned on it. And now they decide it doesn't exist anymore, which is crazy, like especially in, in, in the States. Uh, there's so much going on, it, I can't even keep up with it. But we'll see, in a re we'll, we'll see a reemergence in the spring of occupations and other things that look to the media like Occupy. But I say, like, because Spain started it, let's look at what's happening in Spain now that was demonstration last week in Madrid. So you notice the first one and this one is even bigger, okay? 
And there was a one-day general strike in Spain two weeks ago, which was massive. And what's happening in Europe, which is not quite as advanced here, is you have one reality that the politicians, and that includes socialist parties, are working on, which is a neoliberal frame. And the people are saying, no, we're not paying the price for this. And this is not going away. This is a revolution, not in the way that we thought of it in the 60s or the 70s, not an armed insurrection, but it's a revolution of people saying, no, we're not going to allow our democracy be stolen by 1% of the population and really less than 1%. We're not going to allow our governments that we elect to make policy that just benefit the rich and the rest of us suffer and give up everything our parents and our grandparents fought for. No, we're not going to do that. Maybe we don't know all the alternatives. Maybe we don't have all the answers. But one thing we do know, this is not democracy. And this is not the kind of life that we want to live. And that's why I think the student movement here is an example of this. Because they're saying, no, we don't want a tuition hike. And everybody's saying, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, tuition's twice as expensive in the rest of the, uh, rest of the country. That's right, you know, and I teach in Ontario. And I'll tell you that every one of my students has to work. And many of them have to work full time. And they can't be as engaged in the, in the scholarly work, in the, in, the, in, the, in the academic work as students here are. And I noticed such a difference, such a difference, I can't tell you. You know, at first I thought, what is it? Are people in Montreal smarter? I don't think so. I mean, I used to think they were smarter, but I don't, I, that was just the francophone side though, you know. <laughs> no, I, I don't know, you know, like, and then I realized what it is. And what it is is, the students in my class don't have to work full time to get through school. And they don't have to worry about having debt $40,000 when they graduate. And then, well, they, they do have to worry about no jobs like the rest of the country. And they're saying, no, we're not going to accept that tuition hike. And they're right. They're the benchmark here. They're the ones who are standing against neoliberalism. And, we, and I think it's important that we, and that's all of us, support them. Because they're, they're doing what that group in Madrid is doing which is, is, is part of that global movement that's saying no, that's saying no to this kind of politics, no to this stolen democracy, and that we want a society in which we care for each other. We want a society where wealth is shared. We want a society where everyone has enough to eat, a roof over their head, a good free education, and good medical care, and the opportunity to be whoever they want to be. That's the kind of dream that we have, and we're going to fight for it. And the young people today are rising up to fight for that dream, in my opinion. So in the United States, they're going to have a rally on May, a, a, a general, they're calling it a, gen, they originally called it a general strike, and now because, not exactly a general strike in the old sense of the word, they're calling a day without the 99% in their usual brilliant slogans that they have. And they're saying to everybody to stay home on May 1st. Now, I don't know if Occupy is going to be doing this in Toronto, I mean in Canada, so maybe someone can inform us. But I think they'll have quite a bit of, and I'm going to end with it, quite, I, I talked too much, didn't I? I talked too long, but I'll leave it at that. I think we're going to have quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of, uh, of resonance for this across the United States. Because, you know, when they had their bank day, when they told everybody, they suggested to everybody that they take their money out of the banks and put it in the credit union, they had a massive shift. In fact, Bank of America really started big time trying to change all their policies because they were being so hurt by the Occupy movement saying, take your money out of the Bank of America and put it in to credit unions. So I think they're going to have a big impact with this. I don't know how much. And I have no question that whatever forms the Occupy movement takes, and this global movement takes, and we're calling it the Occupy movement, um, uh, it's going to go forward. Because I know, I come from a generation that radicalized. We didn't radicalize around women's issues at first, most of us. We didn't radicalize around environmental issues or gay and lesbian rights issues. We radicalized around, you know, one, two things, breaking out of the restrictions that our parents lived under, you know, uh, sexual restrictions, uh, work restrictions, all kinds of, you know, uh, well, if you've watched Mad Men, you know. <laughs> and, and then we started to see things because we called it, you know. We called the elephant in the room. We said, no, we don't want to live like this. 
And then we started to see women's inequality. We started to see environmental destruction. Gays and lesbians started to come out of the closet, and we supported them. And so I come from a generation that revolted against the existing system. And I think this is a generation, and, what did we, and we produced massive changes in the society, but this generation isn't just revolting and rebelling. It's creating alternatives in its revolt and in its rebellion, and they're positive alternatives. And all you had to do is go on that march and see the joy in that march, the creativity last Thursday. And so I have so much optimism about the potential, not just the potential, but the fact that this generation is going to change the world for the better. And I hope all of you will join and help it in whatever way you can. Thank you. So questions? Yeah, questions? Yeah. Okay. We can go a bit longer. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so questions, comments, try and keep them short. I so would ask can... you, if you yeah. don't mind, to go to the microphone, and please, it's best if you do ask a question. Yeah. And also, can we have some women come up to the mic before we have all men? I mean, it's just, no, want the first man can go, but it just drives me crazy. I'm sorry, I'm an old-time feminist, and I don't know why it is 40 years later, women hesitate to go up to the mic, and men always know what they think and get up. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not like that, so... <laughs> It drives me crazy, but I, I, I can't permit it, and I just can't permit it in a meeting I'm in. So I, I'll tell you, well, Charlie Demare. Before I you start, I don't see okay. the gender of the person that I'm talking to, so it doesn't make a difference to me. But okay, okay. that's true. <laughs> well, you you might not see it, but it exists. Okay, go. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Yeah. I'm just yeah. Just I just tell you Charlie Demare's joke. Char you know Charlie Demare is a Canadian comic, so he's also a, a progressive guy. And he, he stood at the mic, and there was like a meeting like this, and there was all, but there was middle-aged white guys at the mic, all the way to the back. And he said, I don't know what it is about a mic that men want to get right up to it. <laughs> and you know what? They all sat down right away. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I don't have such problems. <laughs> I can touch it. Okay. That doesn't bother you. Okay. No. <laughs> so I just have one comment to make and one announcement. Okay. Um, my comment is on the disillusionment of young people with the, what previous generations were, were calling democracy, uh, the democratic system. Yeah, yeah. I think that has been going on for many, many years. If you see the participation uh, in elections and the electoral uh, campaigns of the young people has been dropping dramatically for the past 20 years. So it's not something suddenly happened today and we said, oh, we don't like it anymore. The signs were there. And people in the Occupy, I think th th there are many different currents, but I think a big part of the Occupy movement and the movements around the world say that representative democracy does not work for us. It worked 300 years ago, but it's insane to keep on insisting that we need this kind of system. We, like what you talked about, direct democracy, and the word that people are scared to use, anarchism, is uh, very pertinent in the Occupy movement. People say we're all the same, we have equal rights, we don't want a hierarchy. That's one comment I would like to make. And the second is the, the announcement that uh, we occupy movements and indignados and movements uh, in other countries, Arab countries, Greece, Italy. Uh, we've been organizing a reoccupation day on the 12th of May. Um, and a second thing, on the 15th of May, uh, there will be, it's a symbolic day, about all the alternatives and solutions that you talked about, we want on the 15th of May to present them and encourage people to jump on and basically become independent of this system that is destroying our society and our world and to bring uh, people together to create a different way of a different space of living and uh, organizing society. So I would like to invite you all to search on 12th of May Global Action Day and the 15th of May and be in touch and oh, participate. Uh, I think if you don't participate and you just watch it, nothing is ever going to happen. I agree. Yeah, next. Please. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Louise Morin. I was wondering if you find an importance in uh, putting some issues uh, in front of the scene, like uh, tax havens and uh, the ideology that we should not uh, tax capital and uh, the result of this that we see like all services are cut. Do, we, do you think we should fight for precise goals like this? Well, um, yeah, what I say in my book is that 
I think the strength of the Occupy movement right now is that it's not focusing on specific issues. It is supporting, though. Like, I know, I've talked about Occupy Toronto because it's what, I know, it's what I know the best, is that Occupy Toronto has been very supportive of various issues. And all the Occupies, you know, anti-poverty uh, uh, struggles, um, uh, struggles around the Tobin tax in Britain. Uh, there's particular issues that Occupy's mobilized around, but I think that it's their strength that they don't focus on particular issues because as the... Uh, Young, as, uh, what's your name? As Nicola said earlier, uh, before you, uh, they're talking about a complete transformation of society. They don't want to put demands on a government that's illegitimate to them. And so if we're talking about a complete transformation of society, uh, uh, you know, asking for small changes, which in, in essence are these kind of changes, alone is not enough. Supporting people who are, so for example, supporting people are asking for those changes. So for example, there were, there were um, robocall uh, protests right across the country uh, last, like on Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, and a lot of Occupy people helped to build those, but the Occupy movement didn't call them because it's not what they're doing. What they're doing is they're creating the space. They're shifting the, the first thing I think is they're shifting the sands so that people start to see protests as legitimate, so that people start to think about, like I, you know, as someone who talks in the media, I can talk about things now that I couldn't talk about before Occupy. Nobody understood what I was talking about, but now they do. I can talk about capitalism. I can talk about all kinds of stuff. I, couldn't, I can talk about how we're moving toward an authoritarian system and away from democracy. In a way, I've been writing about that for years, but I could never really talk about it before in the media. So I think that these demands that you're talking about are important, but I don't think Occupy should be leading. I think they can support. And then it's up to them. Like, I think it's an evil... Like, the thing with participatory democracy is it's not up to me to tell them what to do, right? If I want to have an argument what to do, I'll go to a GA, right? I think that it's up to them to decide where they're going. And that process, my friend Clara Valverde, who's in Spain, and who's, I quote quite extensively in the book, she says, it's amazing, Judy, because she's like me, an old activist. She says, it's amazing what happens when you have a dialogue and not competing monologues. And a lot of politics, including on the left, have been competing monologues. You know, I have my position, you have your position, and then we fight it out. Well, they're not doing that. They're actually having a dialogue, listening, talking, you know. And it's, it's difficult. It's not easy because it's not what we're used to, but it's happening. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. It was phenomenal. Um, I just want to uh, comment on a question. Uh, firstly, I find that a lot of people who come to Occupy are always like, Occupy should do this, Occupy should do that. And the same thing we tell, uh, I mean, you tell everyone is that it's, it's you, it's up to you. Um, so anyone who wants to organize anything, it, it's all in themselves. It's all finding the people who agree with you and who think it's a good idea, and then actually organizing yourselves to, to get together and do it. Um, it's, it's one thing that, that Occupy has taught me is, is that it's incredibly empowering um, so if you want something done, stand up and do it yourself. Um, and second, secondarily, a uh, question. Uh, you're right, the media plays us like a fiddle. Um, it's, it's pretty embarrassing. And we've created alternative medias as best as we can, and um, a live stream and, and photojournalism. Um, and we have a lot of that. But it's not reaching, I mean, it's not reaching the people in this room. It's reaching a very specific, well, maybe it's reaching some of the people in this room, but it's reaching a very small area. How do we... Um, how would you recommend we, we change that or change the dialogue? Um, and on top of that, I've, I've noticed that a lot of people complain, oh, it's all about police brutality now. It's all, we just, we're trying to capture some, some protester who's standing still getting punched in the face and then we can show that to people and, and now people are just rolling their eyes at that too. So it's just, it's not helping. It's, mm -hmm. they're like, it would be better if you're focusing again on the issues, but now we're fighting for free speech at the same time. I don't even know. It's, yeah. it's overwhelming to be honest. Okay. Um, well, when I look at the, in the states, what I see is that the combination of the Occupy generated media, if we want, and then the existing alternative media, like Democracy Now!, um, like uh, um, The Nation, um, Mother Jones, which I hadn't heard about in year, in decades, was really, I thought, doing great coverage of Occupy. The combination of that has been very powerful. And here we do have uh, alternate media. We have Rabble, we have the Thai NBC, we have Straight Goods, we have Dominion here, um, uh, Media Co-op. We have to, I think we have to build those up. So one thing I say is that if you're spending money on the mainstream media now, like a subscription to the Gazette or the Globe and Mail, for example, give, give that money to alternate media. 
Because if we could fund alternate media like they're funded in the states, then we could bypass the mainstream media, says someone who works in the mainstream media. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, we need more people like me in the mainstream media, right? <laughs> like, really? Like, it's, it's grotesque what's happened in Canada. I mean, just look at Le Devoir, which has maintained itself as probably the only independent newspaper left uh, in the mainstream media. And, you know, yesterday, uh, on Saturday, they had a four-page pull-out pull out section on Madeleine Perron, a tribute to Madeleine Perron. It was amazing. I was just amazed by it, right? Whereas, you know, the La Presse barely covered that she died. And so I think that the corporate media, that we have to start voting with our feet. About, I mean, I know young people are doing that, but I think the rest of us have to vote with our feet about the corporate media. If they're not covered, like for example, the media in English Canada is not covering the student strike, the biggest mass movement we've seen in this country in decades, in decades, and they're not covering it at all. Maybe a little, you know, one line on Thursday. Um, I think we have to vote with our feet. Take the, and I'm doing that. I'm taking the money that I send to the Globe and Mail and I'm giving it to alternate media because that's who can, because in the States they don't need the mainstream media anymore. They can overcome them. They can overwhelm them. And I think the Occupy the Media idea is a great one, which is we create alternative media and that puts pressure on the mainstream media. So when they have, like, like when they had the at issue panel, where all three of them dismissed Occupy, I think we should be just writing the CBC and, you know, just, you know, bombarding them with emails and with posts on their website saying, what are you doing? Like, for example, I'll give you an example of this, and this has nothing to do with Occupy. The CBC, the NFB, all of these agencies have been told not to talk about the cuts in the budget and not to talk about the fact that they've been told not to talk about it. So I'm on cue, and I'm talking about the CBC cuts, and finally Jean Gomeshi decides he's going to, the hell with it, he's going to talk about the CBC cut. And Peter Mansbury doesn't talk about the CBC. It was incredible. Hmm. Well, Radio Canada did, because they don't, you know, they're in a stronger position. But like we're starting to move toward an autocratic system and the media, it's bothering the media now. It's bothering them. And I think now's the time to really push them. So I would say, but also it'd be good to have like in Wall Street, they have like a whole committee that's all about messaging and media. So get some people who have some, um, you know, knowledge of how to get better coverage in the mainstream media and that'll help too, right? Yeah, yeah. thank you. And, yeah. And if there's anybody here who's like that, get involved in Occupy Montreal. Talk to me. Info at OQPY.net. <laughs> if you're interested in working in media in Occupy, info at OQPY.net. Thanks a lot. Hi there. Um, this is it's sort of more of a comment, but it's something that I would really enjoy if you expanded upon a bit more. But you mentioned the 1960s and how um, sort of social systems or social services in Canada were better funded or more and that there was like less, uh, less homelessness. Um, with regards to the student movement, like that it's, it's fairly pertinent because actually one of the justifications in the university funding plan um, is that it would be like equalizing tuition to the same as, as tuition was in 1968. And I mean, I have a huge problem <laughs> just with, with that statement, with, with that statement being said as a good, thing, um, although I wasn't able to find complete facts about enrollment in 1968, uh, enrollment of minorities, enrollment of women. Um, anyways, I think that, that it's really important to like, think critically about the past and about what was, what was potentially better and what was worse. And I, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate uh, that you, that you ex sort of said that like people now and people always should be not just looking to change to alternatives that already exist or to things that we've already kind of processes or um, periods that we've already gone through, but that we should be looking to change things into uh, change things in ways that we haven't yet seen. So I think that when people say that the demands of, of students or the demands of any of these movements are unrealistic or um, yeah, that they, they're unfair based on what's happened in the past. Uh, I, I, so, I so strongly resent that because I want, to, <laughs> I want to live in a world that's better than the world is right now and that's better than the world was in the past. So thank you for saying that. Um, okay, so I was here in the 1960s and uh, the McGill campus was 30% women. So that's one answer to your question. Very few working class people. Um, 
were at McGill then. It was just beginning to happen that working class people were having access to uh, university education. And part of what we were fighting for was to open up the universities to a bigger diversity of people. They were elite institutions. I mean, McGill didn't allow Jews in for a long time uh, onto, into McGill in the 50s. So, um, so, so to say that, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that argument. I don't know the, I don't know the data, so I can't really speak about it. But what I'm saying is that um, I shouldn't have said in the 60s, because in the 60s we fought for more equality, and then we won more equality in the 70s and the 80s, right? And so it, 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 we were fighting for democracy and equality in those days. That's what the student movement was about, was, taught, was, was more democracy. It started out about more democracy on campus. And we succeeded in getting some of that, which is now, I think, starting to be turned back. Um, so, um, so anyway, yeah, so I don't think that's a very good argument because uh, university wasn't accessible in the 1960s at all, really. It changed in the 70s, I think. Started to be accessible, but it wasn't fully accessible. It's not my area of expertise, but I'm going to have to learn because I'm speaking about, about it at the end of the month. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm really short. <laughs> uh, it's actually kind of picking up on that comment. Um, you mentioned that on one hand, uh, the occupiers are, you know, they're, re they're, they're inventing something new, but on the other hand, you also made reference to, to a lot of great things that already exist kind of in pockets that mm -hmm. have been invented that they're also picking up. For example, they, you know, said switch all your money to bank co-ops. So, uh, and they also use like alternative currencies. And so I guess I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about maybe some things that they've picked up that, you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So how are they balancing that and what kind of things are they picking up? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Well, in my book, which I didn't have time to do here, thank you, which I didn't, I didn't, I took him this office. My bruise isn't as bad as it was, so <laughs> I broke my shoulder three weeks ago. Um, in in uh, my book, I go into the roots of Occupy, and I look at the civil rights movement, the women's movement, um, the anti-globalization movement, and some other things. But cooperative is a good example. Um, the cooperative movement is being picked up in a lot of places by Occupy, um, but of course, the co because uh, the, I, I think this is true, we could say this is true of all the movements that came out of the 60s is that while we had in our heads that what we were doing was making a revolution, and this is a good lesson for Occupy, I think, too, and I think they have taken the lesson. While in our heads we were making a revolution, what in fact we did was reform the system. We reformed the system in very important ways, like, for example, uh, moving you know, in the status of women, which has been positively revolutionary. Um, but we didn't transform the society. And as a result, now, or really in the last 20 years, all of the movements we created um, have, have, have hit up against the wall of neoliberalism. So the women's movement went as far as it could do, it could go without creating economic equality, because women still make 70% of what men make, right? Um, the environmental movement went as far as it could go without um, transforming capitalism so that uh, corporations don't have un almost unfettered rights to exploit the land and to, um, and to pollute the waters, right? Um, so all of us are, are hitting up against this system. And what's happened as a result is that we, ha we created this idea of democracy and we're going toward an authoritarian system, I think. Um, I think it's really clear in the last budget that that's what Stephen Harper is doing. He is moving us, attempting to move us toward a more and more authoritarian system. It's not even a right and left thing. I was talking to, like I said, I was on Tommy Schumacher today, and he's got problems with it too, and he's to the right of Stephen Harper. But he believes in democracy. He believes in democracy, right? And there's Reform Party people who are starting to break with Stephen Harper because they believe in democracy. And so even though they're like, you know, on economic issues, I mean, they basically want free and unfettered markets, but they do want democracy. I don't know how that's possible myself, but anyway, that's... <laughs> But in any case, um, I, I mean, I've worked with those people to work for electoral reform, for example. So, so I think that um, I think that it's imp so I think I lost my train of thought now. So I guess that what I'm saying is that how do you create transformation using? I think your point is good. Using some of what we've learned over the years, because I mean, we have been we have a richness of social movements in this country in Europe. In, in the United States, and we all were fighting for very similar things, you know, not just in my generation, but in generations before. I mean, I, I quote a, an article in my book about um, how 
Um, uh, this one guy saw in the Occupy movement a similar movement to the workers, his parents, and the workers' movement in the 30s, the kind of ways in which people helped each other and supported each other in the, during the Depression. And so I think, I think Occupy, partly by knowledge and partly by osmosis, is picking up a lot of that knowledge, and I think it's up to people like me and others who, 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 are, who have experienced that to share that knowledge and also to share what's happened in Latin America around participatory budgets, around uh, factory occupations, and all this kind of thing. And it's happening. It is happening. So I don't, and another difference between Occupy, you know, in the 60s we used to say don't trust anybody over 30, right? <laughs> but Occupy is completely welcoming all of us oldsters, you know? Like I haven't seen any discrimination against old people except the fact that you have to sleep on the ground, which is in and of itself a bit, at least in my case, <laughs> discrimination. But, you know, Occupy is completely open to, but uh, probably my own decision, but anyway. Occupy is completely open to everyone to participate, and that includes people who want to share knowledge. As long as what you want is you go with an open heart and not with the idea that you can tell them what to do and you know better than they do what to do. That's all. It's a big challenge for some of us, that. But <laughs> we can do it, you know. It is possible. I just wanted Sorry. to say, oh. I think we'll limit it to the people okay. who are already at the microphones. There will be a reception afterwards at which you're welcome to continue the conversation. Okay. Molly? <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just wondering, because you have you know, vast amounts of experience um, in Canada in the women's movement, as well as um, kind of like looking at Occupy from both like an insider and outsider perspective. And as somebody who's involved with both Occupy and the student movement in Quebec right now from an insider's perspective, just in terms of like strategies and tactics, like do you find that there are similarities at all between Occupy and what's happening in Quebec with the students right now? And, you know, if so and if not, what do you think um, are, are the best kind of strategies and tactics to be using um, in these situations in order mm -hmm. to, to make this a successful movement? Well, I think the Occupy, the student movement is more of a classical movement that it's fighting around an issue, right? So in that sense, it's a class, and it's got like elected leadership and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And that way it's similar. It's different, right? But in the way that it's similar is in the spirit of it, you know? Like I was on the march, right? And I can't tell you how many people give me the thumbs up and smiled at me and, you know, really made me feel welcome, not like I was like, you know, in the wrong place or something, right? Like there's that spirit of inclusion that's there, there's that joy, I think, rather than, you know, sure, people are angry at the way things are, but that's not what they're focusing, that's not what you feel when you're around them. What you feel is their passion for change, right? Their connection to each other. So I think that's similar. I think the, the um, how smart they are, it's very similar, you know, I think the student leaders are really great in the media and, and how they're portraying it. And also in their kind of strength, you know, that they're not backing down, that they're not letting Sheree get away with saying he won't talk to them, that they're being really clear, no, we're not going to accept that there can be a tax hike, and uh, there can be a, a tuition hike to talk to you. We don't think there should be a tuition hike. So they're standing firm and that kind of courage, I think. So in that sense, the, I think the qualities are very similar, but the, you know, the form is different. And I think the student movement is saying more than just no tuition hikes. I think they're saying no to neoliberalism. I think overall that's the message. And I think that's the message I'm hearing from everybody I talk to who supports them. They understand that. So I think that's the other thing that's similar. <laughs> Uh, okay, I guess I guess I want to comment on the media coverage that I've noticed, and then okay. ask a question after that. But I just um, so after the march, I looked at the Toronto Star, I believe it was, and the way that they portrayed it through images, the march through images was a uh, an individual wearing a mask looking angry at the police officers, which I think is just a gross uh, misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of topical to what you're saying. But um, I kind of have an individual question uh, in terms of grassroots movements trying to find funding. I was wondering, with your wealth of experience, if you had any kind of advice as to which direction to look. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. Well, you know, in general, where we look is at the labor movement. So, okay. um, labor movement's having tougher times now, so, and, you know, the labor movement was very, at least, I don't know about here in Quebec, but in Toronto, the labor movement was very inspired initially by Occupy and gave them uh, quite a bit. And the same in New York was true. And now it's a struggle. I know I just heard, like New York, at first, New York was, uh, Occupy Wall Street was getting so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. 
And you know, even in, in Nova Scotia, people are walking with checks in their pocket because they have a bank account. You know, um, but that's changed because the first flush is gone, and now it's harder, right? So I think we have to start being somewhat creative about it. Um, and I think you know, we're obviously not getting any government money, that's for sure, <laughs> um, and so, or corporate money, and we don't want any corporate money. So I think yeah, labor movement is one thing. But I think you know, one of the things in Canada is because we've had government funding of and Quebec, we've had government funding of social groups for so long, like the women's movement, environmental groups, they've all gotten money. We've gotten kind of used to that. And so as individuals, we, we don't think about funding the things we believe in. And so we do that in po political. People who belong to political parties always give money to political parties. But people who belong to movements don't necessarily think about sharing their income some with the movement. And I think that we start to have to start inculcating that um, that idea. So the last line in my book is I tell the story of a conversation I had in Vancouver with a, an activist I knew from the old days and I said how I felt about Occupy and he said, well, good luck to them. And I said, no, that's the wrong answer. The right answer is how can I help? Mm -hmm. And I think that for people of my generation who are inspired by what Occupy is doing, one of the ways we can help is to give money. But I think on the Occupy side, they have to be a little more uh, clear about how that money being spent and a little more accountable and so on because there had been some, not, not, not nothing bad, but just a lack of care around that in some occupies. Not in Occupy Montreal, perhaps. Um, so I think, yeah, raising money from individuals is going to have to be the way it's done. And that can be done in many ways. It can be done, you know, like there's a lot of artists who would love to do concerts for Occupy. And, uh, you know, a lot of, and so that can be done that way too. I mean, there's lots of ways like that that it can be done, yeah. In uh, NAC, we used to have a dream auction. That worked really well. You know, where you have an event and you auction off sort of things that people can do so that, you know, someone who's providing a service can give it and then people bid on it. So people always like to give money for something rather than just give the money. So that's another idea. Lots of ideas. Oh, you're next. Sorry. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this book and for your work. I've been inspired by you for years and listening to podcasts and whatnot all the time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on that note of grassroots funding, um, I work for the Sierra Youth Coalition, the youth branch of Sierra Club here in Montreal, and I'm organizing a conference on solutions. Um, I just heard about the May 15th uh, event, so I'm wondering if maybe we can tie it together. I had some funding dropped in my lap to organize an event of my choice, so um, I'm putting it together about uh, solutions, and I'm also really interested in focusing on social entrepreneurship and that sort of crowdsourcing, grassroots, uh, sustainability focused stuff. So I'll be around at the reception if anyone wants to talk about it. My name's Cameron. Um, I think something that I wanted to know from you, um, these values of uh, concentration of wealth, uh, privatization instead of socialization, um, these ideas are being taught in business schools and have been taught in business schools for mm -hmm. 30 years, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Days Hotel is right here, right? Uh, John Molson School of Business down at Concordia. Um, and I think one of the things that I think is really fascinating about Occupy is the idea of getting back to basics. And that it is a, you know, the values, love, care, um, solidarity, consensus over, you know, property, uh, space, control, um, authority, those sorts of things. That's what I think is underlying it all and that there's a power in that that speaks, I think, that goes beyond um, beyond, uh, beyond just the, the physical manifestation. And, you know, the, the, the corporations and the concentration of wealth is, is in due in large part to our participation in the system and the government's purchase of their services, large-scale services. Um, but I also know of really wonderful progressive teachers in business schools. Um, here at McGill, I knew about uh, Warren Nelson, who was teaching a very different kind of, of business. Um, so I was curious if you... <laughs> yeah, I'm right there. Occupy the business schools, right? Well, <laughs> I'm wondering yeah. if you, what your outlook is on that, on, the, on what's being taught in business schools, um, in, in the political culture or the cultural politics here yeah. at McGill. I just, got, I just had an invitation, actually, but unfortunately it was for tonight, um, to speak to the business school at Ryerson. I think it was at Ryerson. Um, about, uh, um, you know, given the Occupy movement, how can you have socially um, 
uh, what's the word, you know, it's the social entrepreneurship word, you know, the triple bottom line mm -hmm. idea um, in corporations, right? What does Occupy mean for corporations? So I thought, boy, that's a challenge. <laughs> Dissolve yourself, uh, you know. <laughs> but I think this idea of occupying business schools is important because I, you know, I teach a course in social movements at, or I used to at Concordia, and I had a lot of business students who really wanted that course to be taught in the business school. And I, you know, if I'd stayed at Ryerson, I would have pushed for that to happen. So I think that, yeah, that's right. You've got this elite that's been educated in business schools um, for a long time now with this particular idea. And without any, really any alternatives, maybe they, learn, they have a course on labor movement and labor unions. That's about it. How to crush so, them. Yeah, what? How to crush them. Yeah. <laughs> well, not just. You know, they try and be fair if you're an academic. So, so I, I think that um, this idea, that's why I love the term, even though I know that it's got problems in terms of the indigenous understanding of it, and I think we have to talk about that, I love the, the, the idea of Occupy. Because the idea of it is not, you know, our idea was smash the state, right? Like we'll get rid of the state and then we'll build a new state, not really understanding that we're the same people that got schooled in this kind of way of doing things. And if we build a new state, we might just be just as authoritarian as the previous state, right? So we had this idea of smash the state. But Occupy's idea is infiltrate everything and change it, you know? Become part of everything and change it, right? From the inside. And I think that's a really powerful idea. Now, I don't know, you know, business schools are obvious. We didn't have business schools before, right? So they obviously are a kind of training ground for the 1%. But, you know, most people are in business schools are not going to be in the 1%, right? They'll just, they'll just hold it up. Yeah, that's right. right. And, and, you know, in Occupy right now, there's a lot of traders who went to, over to Occupy. And they're, creating, they're working on creating alternate bank systems now, right? So there's a lot of people, not, you know, huge numbers, but there are quite significant numbers of... Um, of people who are trained in that school who have decided that they don't like it, you know, that it's gone too far for them. And I think that, you know, just like in the women's movement, in the early days of the women's movement, if we hadn't had women in positions of power supporting us, we wouldn't have been as powerful. And I think the same is true now, that there's going to be people in positions of power who want to see the change that Occupy, maybe not as far as Occupy, most Occupy people, but they want to see that change happen. And we already have it in what you're calling social entrepreneurship or in the triple bottom line movement, you know, who, people who want to change capitalism to be more humane. I don't think it can be done. But people who are saying that, uh, you know, we should have corporations that not only want profit but environmental sustainability and social justice, um, they're doing it. You know, they're doing it in small ways. And I'm not, you know, completely against business at all. But I think that those ideas are important and they are going into, um, they're starting to go into business schools. So I think it's a good idea to, to push for that. And I would, have I would have spoken if I could have. Yeah, I'm talking too much as usual. Okay. Sure. Okay, uh, occupiers in Montreal are, are um, trying to uh, understand the power dynamics within the movement. And, um, and uh, since you have this insight into the Occupy movement and you're a feminist, uh, I, I read the, the Joe Freeman paper of, the, of 1970, I think, and, and she, uh, she suggests that uh, informal uh, power structures be made formal, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a bit, uh, it's a bit dif difficult to, to, to tackle this problem you, uh, given the horizontality of the movement. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to have your insights sure. into, into okay. this. Thank you. Take the other question. You want me to take the both questions? Yeah, it's usually faster. Yeah. Is, is my question related to that? Yeah. Only no. somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, yeah. Sure. yeah, I can do both, yeah. Okay. So I work in administration here at McGill, and I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank the folks at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada for hosting this. Um, my question is related to the role of public in institutions, public post-secondary institutions, in fostering this kind of dialogue and the larger dialogue that's happening around the Occupy movement and around the substantive issues that it raises. In my mind, there's a direct relationship between those issues and the ongoing relevance of the university in that many educated people find themselves in a situation where secure livelihoods are not accessible to them. So really love to hear your thoughts on the role of the university in fostering this. Okay. Okay, I'll start with the first question. It's a very, it's a very important question. Um, there's been a lot of conflict in Occupy around sexism, racism, um, around uh, obnoxious people, you know, obnoxious people who don't list, don't want to follow the rules, 
um, which I don't know what that is, but we've always had it. <laughs> Blowhards, I call them. Um, and, or, and also some disturbed people who can't follow the rules. And the idea of you know, having a completely inclusive, horizontal structure, it's very hard to control that. It's kind of hard to control it, but actually it's not. So that's what we learned from the tyranny. The tyranny of structurelessness was written about, and that's the Joe Freeman article, and it's online, I highly recommend it. It was written about when the women's movement tried to do everything in collectives without any kind of um, power structure. I don't think Occupy is quite like that. I think, I, I, think the, I think the people who started Occupy at least understand power. Like power exists in every situation. Like right now, I have power, right? When I'm a teacher, I have power. When I'm a professor, I may not want the power, but I have power. So, you know, I have to struggle with what do I do? My students want to go on strike. My other students don't want to go on strike. Do I just decide to cancel the class? That's what I would do myself. It's my beliefs. But that's an abuse of power because the students that didn't vote to strike, then they might lose their year and they didn't vote to do that and they didn't participate in a vote or maybe they did. I don't know. Anyway, it's very confusing on McGill. So, um, so I, I had to, like I was so stressed out about that because you have to understand when you have power, you know, and young white men have power in this society. I'm sorry, you know. Maybe they don't want to have power, but they do have power. And so they have to recognize that. And those discussions have to take place, which are discussions of what sometimes gets called anti-oppression. Um, you know, I always think of these things as waffle words, anti-oppression. Now we have safer spaces. You know, it gets less and less what it is, which is anti-sexism, anti-racism, etc. cetera. And, and we have to discuss that, but there's some people who just don't want to hear about it. And then we got to deal with that. So I think there's a lot of work that's been done on this. There's a lot, first of all, there's a lot of facilitate, people who know how to do facilitation to deal with conflict, and they can teach you how to do it. It's not rocket science, and you can do it in a way that makes for more space for democracy, not less. I think the women's movement has a rich experience in this, as do other movements. And we need to, and we need to use those. There's lots of tools, anti-oppression tools, lots and lots of them, which are not conflictual. You know, there used to be, we used to have our idea of, you know, when anti-racism first came up in the women's movement, we'd have like screaming matches, you know, and people would march out and, you know, that's how it started. But we learned over time how to do this without that level of conflict. And those methods exist, those tools exist, you can find them and you can find the people who know how to do it. So um, that's what I would recommend. But I think you have to solve them. If you don't solve the problems, they will destroy the movement. They will. Because people, you know, you cannot have a movement that argues for equality that oppresses people. And that's why the left, one of the reasons the left failed is because of that. You know, one of the reasons a lot of us who are on the left left was because of that. So left the left, you know. So, okay, so, so I'm happy to participate in that in any way I can. Then the, the other question, which is in a way is related, right, is that here we are in a university campus. And, you know, the last time I did this, I got three applauses in ten minutes, so I don't know. We're on a university campus, McGill University. McGill University is seen in Quebec as a bastion of Anglophone privilege with some justification, with a lot of justification if you look at the history. And there are students on this campus who want to be part of the student movement. And the university administration, in my opinion, I know that people won't agree with me, are, are painting these students as if they're akin to terrorists. You know, we get these emails all the time. Watch out! They're at, they're at the gate now, you know. They're down at Roddy Gate. Watch out, you know. You might not want to go there. Like, it's really insane. Like, I, I, the first few emails I got, I said, what is this? Is this like a Monty Python skit? <laughs> Are the students doing this to show, show? And then they sort of toned it down, but it's the same. The idea is that somehow the students are our enemies. They're not our enemies. They're our friends, you know. They're here to fight for accessible education and every university professor and the administration should be supporting them because if these turn into elite institutions, we ain't having a job anymore, you know. So, so I think it's our responsibility as faculty. No, I don't have anything to lose in this situation pretty apparent, because if, if they fire me, I only lose one week's pay, you know? So, <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm aware of that, but, you know, university professors have tenure, and the, uni the professors on this university should, now there, isn't, there was an open letter to the university administration, we're having a meeting tomorrow, and I hope we can sort this out. 
But if we can't, I think every tenured university professor who's sympathetic with the students who want to be on strike should stand up and say so. I really do. Because there's not a risk in that. I'm sorry, there is not a risk in that. And there might be a risk that you won't go quite as fast in your career, but it's time to take a stand. And that's the other thing I want to say, is that there's a lot of us who, you know, who come from the 60s who think of ourselves as progressive, but, you know, we, we, we got bought into, we bought into the neoliberal, you know, I have a mortgage, I have a job, you know how I do, it's important. I think we have to start rethinking that. Things are going to get rough now, you know. Yeah. You're going to have to take a stand. Which side are you on? You know, that wonderful song. You have to decide which side you're on. It's coming. It's coming. It is, it's here, I think, in Quebec right now. It's here on this campus right now. And I think that it's important to support those students who want to be part of this student movement and to shield them from any kind of discipline by the administration. And it's up to us professors to do it. Thank you. Save some of that applause. I'm going to ask now one of our students, Robin Reed Fraser, to come up and officially um, thank um, Judy Rebick. And so I've, I've had the utmost privilege of being in Judy's class, uh, learning about the history of the women's movement in Canada over the course of this semester. Um, I haven't been in her class for a few classes lately because women's studies undergraduates at McGill are on strike right now. Um, but I, I just, I can't express how exciting it has been to be part of your class. Um, I mean, I would be so thrilled to be learning about the history of the women's movement in Canada from someone who has been involved in the capacity that you have Anyway, but given what has been happening um, with the Occupy movements, with all of these protests around the world, and within the context of student strikes in Montreal, and to, to be able to have those conversations where we really talk about not just the big overall kind of important issues, but also can have your insight into you know, what is it that really makes things successful and, and how do you get things done when there are, you know, all of these organizational and kind of logistical and personality issues that will be coming up time and time again in social movements like this one. And, um, yeah, so it, it has just been so lovely to be able to, to have these very real conversations with you um, in the context of kind of all of the craziness that's happened this semester at McGill. Um, so thank you so much for coming to McGill. I, I hope you will come back. I'm sure we will be doing a lot of debriefing over the course of the next while, um, and, and it would be great to continue to, to have your insight. So yeah, thank you so much, Judy. Je vous invite à prendre un verre de vin à côté. But what I want to say is what often happens at these things is we announce the reception and then people who want to rush and talk, want to speak, talk to the speaker rush up here and she's stuck here for a half an hour while we're out um, happily drinking wine. So maybe let her go out there as well and then you can talk with her out there. <laughs>